you can be seated. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. You see, the God I know, He serves all the triumph. And my God, He will never fail. Oh, my God, He will never fail. Because I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. And every one wages, he's going to win. And that's why I'm not backing down from any giant. See, children, how this story ends. How this story ends. Because I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. The battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Because the battle belongs to you, Lord. What the enemy meant for evil. Turn it for good. You turned it for good. Look, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turned it for good. You turned it for good. Lord, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and I know that you turned it. Oh, you turned it for good. You turned it for good. I said you take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turned it for good. Lord, you turned it for good. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Said I. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. How many of you plan on seeing a victory? I'm going to see a victory, because the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory Cause the battle belongs to you, Lord Church, there's power here in the mighty name of Jesus And every war he wages, he is going to win That's why I will not back down from any giant Because I know how the story ends. Oh, I know how the story ends. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle, it belongs to you, Lord. Sing it one more time. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Said, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, 
of you believe and lift those hands and praise Him right now. I don't care what you're going through. I want you to believe I'm going to see a victory. I don't care how hard it is, how dark it is. I'm going to see a victory, Jesus. Lord, we are not made to lose. We are made to win. Oh, you take what the enemy meant for evil. And I know you're going to turn it for good. You're going to turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. Jesus, you're going to turn it. Turn it for good. You're going to turn it for good. Do it again. You take what the enemy meant for evil. I know you're going to turn it for good. You'll turn it for good. Church, he's going to take what the enemy meant for evil. He's going to turn it for good. He's going to turn it. Oh, shout, I will see a victory. I'm going to see one. Hallelujah. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs. Oh, one more time I will see. thank you for the victories we've had and let's thank you for the victories we're yet to have in the name in the name of jesus hallelujah 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 i don't care if it's financial i don't care if it's physical i don't care if it's emotional believe it right now i will see a victory in the name of jesus Yes, yes. Oh, hallelujah. Sing that bridge again. Think about these words. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Come on. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, you take what the enemy did for evil. Oh, think about it, church. And you turn. You turned it. Oh, one more time. You take what the enemy meant for evil. Oh, and you turned it for good. You turned it for good. My Lord, you take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turned it for good. You turned it for good. The battle belongs to the Lord. You believe God's in charge? I'm gonna see a victory. give victory I don't care if you got to get up and walk over to somebody tell somebody right now look them dead in the eye God can still bring victory oh hallelujah hallelujah God can oh let's give him a good hand clap of praise right and I were getting ready for church and I figured out what we was going to sing. We'd never sang this song before. 
my son, he'd heard it. He's like, what's that tune? I'm going to get a victory. He's like, sing that one. So if we did it wrong, I'm sorry. But when a nine-year-old kid remembers a song, it kind of makes an impression on you. Amen. It's, it's time that we started remembering God is in charge of the battle. And he will bring the victory. Oh, let's praise him one more time for that. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to start out tonight with a thought experiment. And I like these because they're cheap, no props involved, just your brain. And if your brain doesn't work good, just pretend you're playing along. But let's imagine right now. Let's say you and your significant other, whether it's a date or marriage, let's say you go somewhere nice. Let's say you, you dress up and, and you drive to Charleston because you're going to take them somewhere fancy. You're going you're to treat them. No happy meal tonight. Fine dining. Man, you had a good meal, great conversation. Nobody got their cell phone out. That's how you know it went good. You're just excited. You're holding hands. Love is dripping off of you like the morning dew. And you're walking to the car, and then somebody grabs you, throws your face right into a brick wall, and you feel the barrel of a gun in the back of your head. And they say, prove to me there's a God or you're dead. What are you going to say? Don't yell anything. I've thought about this. When we was evangelizing a lot, I'd bring this up in youth rallies to see what kids would say. Here's what I'm convinced. There's no good answer. I went to a philosophy conference and asked some Christian philosophers that question. And they all looked at me. None of them come up with an answer. But one guy said this. He said, there's no way to answer that without sounding like you're not really trying to prove there's a God. You're just trying to save yourself. But if you think about it, metaphorically speaking, a lot of people have us under the barrel of a gun saying, prove it. Prove it that Holy Ghost works. Prove it that if I go down that altar, everything's going to be all right. I think you're making it up. I think it's a bunch of humbug. I think your God ain't real. Because if he was, why you got so many empty seats? And why can't you churches get along? Why y'all preach this different stuff? And I watched the Discovery Channel. That Bible made up. Oh, that's, that's sweet when they say that. You can watch TV. That's cute. You need to learn how to read. You're going to be smart. Don't watch TV. Turn that off. So here's, here's a little something I'm going to give you. We're going to build from this. There's two things that are never true or false. Okay? And I, I'll, I'll be gentle here. They should never be true or false. Questions and commands. For example, what time is it? That's not true or false. The command, clean your room. It's not true or false. But you can ask, is it appropriate? So if I walk up to somebody and I say, what time is it? And they don't have a device to tell time. And they can't tell me the time. And I get mad at them. I'm the one that looks like an idiot. Not them. If I tell my son, clean your room, he comes back and says, Dad, it's clean. And I get mad at him, I'm the bad guy there, not him. Now, let's look at this. Let's break it down. Prove there's a God or you're dead. Split that in half. There's the command. Prove there's a God. It's not true or false. But we can ask if it's appropriate. How is it appropriate? If that happened to me, Hopefully, I could say, well, can I ask a question before you pull the trigger? What? Do you believe it's possible that God exists? And if he says, no, I do not believe that it is possible that there is a God, then nothing I say is going to convince him elsewise. I'm dealing with with a man or a woman who's got their mind so stubbornly made up, they're not going to listen to anything. Therefore, I'm a dead man unless God performs a miracle. But 
If they say, I think it's possible there's a God. Uh Aha. Now I got to figure out why they think it's possible, but they don't believe. Sir, before you put that bullet in the back of my head to help me give you an answer, could you explain to me why you don't believe? Nine times out of ten, it'll have nothing to do with a science book. Nine times out of ten, it'll have nothing to do with what they saw on Discovery, TLC, or read on Facebook. Nine times out of ten, they're going to come back with an emotional, psychological response. For example, the late atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell said, if you sit at the bedside of a dying child, you will not believe in God. So what if the man with the gun looked at me and said, I don't believe in God because I had a baby. And I prayed to that God to save my baby. And the baby died. I'm dealing with an emotional, not a logical, an emotional problem. When people do not want to come to church or when people don't come to church, And really, that's not the crust of it. When people don't want to live for God, that's the problem. It's never because they don't understand Scripture per se. It's because something happened that messed their heart or their mind up. And now we got to figure out what we're going to do with that. So if Mr. Russell was sitting here, I'd say, okay, Mr. Russell, the baby died. What are you going to tell the parents? He can't tell them nothing because he has no hope. All he can say is what I told you yesterday. Poop happens. Bury the kid and keep going. But I can walk in and say, would you like to see that child again? What do you mean, preacher? I'm here to tell you you're more than the blood. You're more than the bones. You're more than your molecules. There's something inside of you that is beyond the flesh. It it touches another dimension. It's called your soul. And just because you leave here, that doesn't mean you don't exist anymore. You exist somewhere else. And that pain that you feel, it'll be replaced when you walk through those gates and see those loved ones again. So my point is this. People are fighting the will of God because of emotional problems. And this is what they're going to say. Well, it shouldn't be. Ah. Now there's a curious expression. It shouldn't be. Why? I was in a man's house. I was in his house doing a job. He figured out I was a preacher. If you're really, really called of God, you don't have to advertise it. People figure it out. He starts asking me questions. And I could tell he's trying to poke the bear. Finally, he says, you know what? He says, I go to church. I sing in a quartet. He says, I don't believe none of it. I said, why? Why? He said, because he took me to the bedroom, walked me right in the bedroom. He said, you see that bed right there? Yeah. My wife had a hard cancer, and she lay in that bed praising God. She lay in that bed praying. She laid in that bed believing in God, and all she did was get sicker every day, and she died in that bed. You can't tell me God's good. I thought to myself, if he keeps pressing I'm going to make him mad. And he kept pressing. He said, it's bad. It shouldn't happen. So I turned around and said, tell me why it's bad. Why is your wife dying of cancer bad? Because it is. I said, no. That's a five-year-old answer. You give me a man's answer. Why is it bad that she died of cancer? It just is. I said, sir, if you take God out of the equation, everything's just an opinion. I said, so you don't believe in God. So I think your wife dying of cancer was a good thing. What do you think about that? He doubled up his fists, 
tears come down his face. I said, sir, what do you think about that? You take God out, there is no objective right or wrong. There is no true. There is no false. It's all a matter of opinion. It's all that might makes right business. If there is no God, Hitler wasn't wrong. It was Hitler's opinion. He wanted to kill the Jews. We should have left him alone. If there is no God, we should have never reversed Roe versus Wade. It's your body. Do what you want to do. There is no God. But there's a God up in heaven that says, All souls are mine. There's a God up in heaven that says, Thou shalt not, and thou shalt. If I didn't make the point, I stood at a Starbucks in Boston, Massachusetts, early one morning, sun just peeking, and there's a guy serving coffee. He was a barista, and he acted like he was running for president. He was smiling, giving out stickers, throwing out that coffee, and I thought to myself, I bet he's smart. So when he gave me the coffee, I said, Can I get your opinion on something? And this is going to touch home because we got little kids here. Yeah. I said, hey, is torturing a baby for fun a good thing or a bad thing to do? He liked to drop my drink. Why do you want to torture a baby? I said, that's not my question. I said, is it a good thing or a bad thing to do? His lip was actually fluttering. He's like, it's bad. I said, why? just is thanks and i left then i got asked to teach this adult class at calvary in indianapolis i thought well i'm gonna ask them pat class i said hey is torturing a baby for fun good or bad everybody in the church shouted bad i said why and you could have heard a pin drop and a lady on the front row said because the government says it is i said i'm glad you said that because what if the government suddenly said torturing babies for fun is okay does that make it right and she looked at me and she said, no. I said, so that means that rule, that truth is something above us that we can't change? Yeah. I said, well, what's above us that makes rules like that? She said, God. I said, bingo. You take God out of the equation, I could take out a gun and shoot all of you all, and I'm not wrong at all. It's a matter of opinion. You take God out of the equation, we can throw our kids out and we don't like them, make them fend for themselves. It's just a matter of opinion. That's why I'm here to tell you, if you think getting God out of your life is going to help you, it does nothing but send you almost straight to hell overnight. Taking God out of your home is not going to make your husband love you more. Taking God out of your home is not going to make your wife love you more. Taking God out of the home is not going to fix your kids. If you ever needed the Lord, you need God. There is no no evil. There is no bad unless there's a God. Because without God, it's just an opinion. That's that's what I believe. I believe it's an opinion. Tell that to the person that steps in front of you at Walmart when you're in line. Hey, I've been here for 30 minutes. You cut in front of me. That's your opinion. Walk into somebody's house, got a big old plasma TV. Just start taking it off the wall. Hey, bro, what you doing? I'm taking this home. That's stealing. I call it a blessing. What's right for you ain't always right for me. What's true for you ain't always true for me. That's the world we live in. What if Mary would have been the modern woman? Blessed art thou, Mary, thy fruit of thy womb. You're going to give birth to the Savior. It's my body. I am woman. Hear me roar. My uterus. You know the Greek word for uterus is hysteria. Is hysteria. And that's where hysterical comes from. And that's why when they take a uterus out of a woman, they call it a hysterectomy because they used to think that was the cure to fixing women when they went crazy. I heard my son go, wow. <laughs> Dad just gave him an education. <laughs> uh, Mom, what's a uterus? <laughs> that's why God gave me a good woman. I'll hear about it after church. She's going to preach to me now. This is how it is. If there is no God, it don't matter. 
But it matters. Okay, well, Brother Corsi, let me tell you this. I believe in God, but he should treat me better. That's what it comes down to. You think you should be treated better. Don't worry, I'm going to get the scriptures in a minute, I promise. Although I've actually quoted some if you've been paying attention. I had a lady that I used to pastor. She played an organ. I don't know if you all remember what an organ is. We had one. And when she was anointed, I didn't mind her playing it. But when she wasn't anointed, I wish she'd get off the thing. But uh, she was loud. You ever been around people's loud? This is their normal voice. That's how she talked. And if you came to the altar to pray, everybody heard what she told you. And all these women used to come pray because their kids were in jail. I pastored people who had more kids in jail than anybody I knew. And she'd be like, you just got to trust God and believe God's going to save that kid. God's going to touch that kid. You just got to believe, baby. She called everybody baby. Baby. And she was white. But anyhow. All of a sudden, she quit coming to church. Well, I wasn't a pushy pastor. I know you get sick sometimes. And, I, you know, I wasn't the guy sit on the platform with a cell phone going, where you at? Why ain't you here? Jesus going to get you. No, I didn't do that. She missed two services. So I thought, well, I better go pay her a visit. I knocked on her door. She come to the door, just bloodshot eyes, crying, snotting around. I said, what's the matter? My baby's in jail. I said, your son's in jail? Yes. I said, what did he do? He beat his wife again. It was a cycle. And then she said that she goes, it's not fair, Brother Court. God shouldn't have let that happen. And before I knew it, I looked at her. I said, you're the one not fair. And this was a woman that would smack you. She smacked people in the church before. That hand come back. I said, hear me. I said, what you're saying is you're better than all them other women in our church. It can happen to them, but it shouldn't happen to you. That's what you're saying. (laughs) That's all I got. And we prayed. And she came to church. And God got her son out of jail. Whenever we quit coming to church because we're like, God shouldn't let this happen. God shouldn't let me do this. You're saying you're better than everybody in this building. George, I thought we came to a revival. We are, Martha. Hush. You're saying that you're better than everybody else. God is no respecter of person. God loves you enough to let you go through the valley just like he does everybody else. One of the best revelations I ever got, and I got it out of a children's book. that C.S. Lewis wrote, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe from the Chronicles of Narnia. God is good, but he is not safe. God is good, but he will take you right into the valley of the shadow of death. That's close. God will dangle you off the edge, hanging by a thread, a hair of hope, and he'll let you dangle there for a while, but he's good. He won't leave you dangling. When I went through all that abuse, when I went through all of it, when God finally dealt with me about it, it was simply like this. Was I a bad God because I sent a naked boy out to fight a giant? Was I a bad God because I let those Hebrew boys get thrown in the fire? Was I a bad God because I let Daniel get thrown in there with those lions? you got to realize all they did was shake things up. But when they came back with Goliath's head and they came out unburned and him and Daniel was sleeping on the lion's belly, and didn't even get licked. They had revival. He said, you got to realize, boy, people have lost their mind because of what you went through. You want to know why you didn't lose your mind? Because I was there. It wasn't a safe time. But as good in the tragedy as I was in the mountaintop. You got to learn something. God is not safe. He'll take you down a bumpy road. He'll he'll he's like a mother bird. He will throw you out of the nest and just let you fall down. But he will catch you before you get to the bottom. He is good, but is not safe. We want 
No disrespect, please. We want God. I'm going to use you as an example. This is what we want right here. He looks just like a great grandfather. That's what he not not a great great grandfather, but a good grandfather. This looks like the guy that when he sees a kid come by, he's like, "You want some candy?" This looks like the kind of guy like, you want a quarter. And we like him because, and I, I'm I'm getting there. The pastor already made fun of me today because I'm getting that hair color too. Can you believe that? I need to pray for him, don't I? Uh, <laughs> We want a God that just kind of creeps around the cane, just all happy. How you doing, baby? How you doing? Oh, you want some candy? That's not God. That is not God. Lord, we want you. Okay. But I'm going to tear the roof off your house. And I'm going to lower the disease-ridden family that you can't stand right down the roof of that house. And we all go to have a chat. I will park the baddest, smelliest, ugliest people right next to you and say, let's have some fun. I will call you to go into hell. Do you know in the state of Michigan there's a city named Hell, and when I read an article about it, at the end it said there's still no church in hell. It, that name and, that, and because it freezes over every winter scares every preacher away. But that's right where God will send you. Huh? God is not safe. So if you want to come to church and think you can clap your hands and wink like they used to do on that show Bewitched and everything going to be all right, it ain't going to happen. God will sometimes mess it up more before he makes it better. He'll call you to preach and send you to people who don't even want to listen to you. He'll call you to do something for him and make it look like you're going to fail. But you got to hold on and believe that he's not safe, but he's good. And he does not answer all of our questions. Ah, time to get to our text. John chapter 21. Peter's getting jealous because he found out he's going to die. But he also thinks that John's not. And Peter says, Lord, what about this dude? Verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. He told Peter, it's none of your business. Now follow me. It's none of your business. I have learned that almost 80% of my prayers, that's the answer. It's none of your business. It's none of your business. I was telling a brother here last night, I had this young couple, weren't married, living in sin, carefree, early early 20s at best. Girl gets uh, pregnant. They start coming to Sunday night service, and they always sit in the back. And I'd preach, and we'd sing, and it did not look like they paid a lick of attention. I'm at work one day. The guy calls me. Brother Corsi, can you please come to the hospital? I called my boss. I always had a standing degree with my boss. Hospital call, come. Just call him. I could go. I get there. I'm here to see so-and-so. Oh, you need to come with us. They took me in a room. They said, you need to sterilize. Okay. I don't know what's going on. I'm washing. I'm scrubbing. They give me a suit. They cover up my head in like a hazmat suit. And they said, now, Reverend, whatever you do, you cannot touch this child. Okay. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I walk into a room. There's an incubator with a baby who had see-through skin. And all the organs were in backwards. I could see this child's brain. I could see this child's stomach. I could see its lungs. And that belly was barely moving. And here comes the dad. Can you imagine? Just got out of puberty, and this is his first baby. He looks at me, he said, Brother Corsi, you preach faith. If God will heal this baby, I promise we'll be at every service. I promise I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And suddenly, in the back of my head, I'm like, God's going to make something good out of this. And we prayed. And then I went back to see the mother. She wasn't even allowed to see her own child. She was having difficulties. 
Two days later, that baby died. I'm going to tell you what I did. I drove straight to the church. And I slammed that door open, and I slammed it shut, and I locked it. And I yelled, anybody in here? Because I had Sunday school teachers sometimes would be in there at night working on their room. Nobody was there. And I walked right down that aisle, and I was yelling, why? I beat that altar until I was bleeding. Why? Why did you not heal that baby? By your stripes, does that not work anymore? I screamed till I couldn't scream anymore because I'm thinking, what if that was me? And do you know what God did? We had, after that, we had another baby in the church die. And I went back to the church and I'm like, do you hate us? It was another new convert family. Died of crib death. What is wrong? I got the call. Will you preach the funeral? I'm like, well, if you just saw me last night, you wouldn't be asking me to do this. And I sit down. I said, I don't know what to say. But then I remember David on a roof. He sees Bathsheba. Me like he. Go get her. Man after God's own heart. And he cheats with her. And then like a thug has that husband knocked off on purpose because he found out Bathsheba was pregnant. But then when the child's born, there's trouble. And David hits his face. He's praying and fasting, praying and fasting, praying and fasting. And they come to him a week later and say, child's dead. He gets up, washes his face, anoints his face, and he goes and eats. He didn't do what I did, and that puzzled me. Why did he not do that? They said, David, what's wrong with you? And he said, I will see that child again. I stood in front of a shoebox casket, and I dealt with the question, why? And I looked that couple in the eye, and I said, I promise you, if you live for God, you will see this baby again. And that's what I'm here to tell you. Why do your children turn out the way they do? I don't know. And God's not going to give you an explanation all the time. But that's where faith that passes understanding says, I will believe. And sometimes when you go to God and you pray, people in the church get exactly what you're praying for, and you don't. What's going on? Why? Or he tells the guy next door to start mowing his grass. Hey, you know what? That preacher's preaching. Go over and mow the yard right now. And if we pray, God, why is that guy mowing the yard right now? He'll probably say, it's none of your business. Because if he wasn't on the mower, he might be sitting in the house and have a heart attack. Who knows? We face things in life that we don't understand. And when we go to God, we're going to be like, God, why? And he's going to say, it's none of your business. It's none of your business. God, how could you allow this to happen? It's none of your business. What are you going to do? I'm going to hold on to God, and I'm going to believe that everything lost in the end I will gain. When Job went through the trial, he got double everything pretty much, and he got the exact same number of children. Why? Because he had more children on the other side waiting on him. So really, it was doubled as it is. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on. God will not let you down. God is not safe. Luke chapter 13, starting at verse 4. Jesus, this was my go-to scripture at 9-11. Of those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Hear me. Jesus gave no explanation on why those people died in that tower. He just said they were not any worse than anybody else. He just said what matters is when your day comes, you be ready. Now I realize, myself included, we're all getting older. We have no say on how we're going to kick the bucket. With the exception of some crazy form of suicide, we have no say. Brother, my last days may be spent in a bed in excruciating pain. 
And God will say, it's none of your business why you're dying that way. Some of you may spend the last day sitting at a home and can't even remember your own name. But what matters is before that day came, you knew who Jesus was. It is not up to me how I die. I may die in a car crash. I may die an easy death. I may die in my sleep. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell him. Peter, it's none of your business what happens to this man. It's not even none of your business what happens to you. But what is your business? Be ready. Be ready, because Peter, I'm a good God, but I'm not safe. You're going to hang upside down on a cross, and you're going to get mocked and ridiculed. But you know what? I'm still good. You won't have to cross Jordan alone. I stood in the Roman Colosseum a few years ago, and while the tour guide has explained to us the history she got on the martyrs of the Christian. And I got to looking at the floor of that Colosseum, and you could see the holes. She said while they would be looking at uh, Caesar or whoever was in charge, they would actually be bringing up lions and bears behind them. They didn't even know it. And then he would laugh and tell them to turn around, and these beasts would land on them and devour them. And then the Romans would take these beasts and kill them not long after they had ate the Christians and eat the animal. It's kind of like saying, we are eating the animal that ate you, plus we're eating you. It's the ultimate declaration of, we win. But now, one thing the Catholic Church did, they said, if you want to keep that Colosseum in this city, right where Caesar set, you put a huge cross. And now when you go to that Colosseum, there's a humongous cross standing there. And I thought to myself, you know what? It's hilarious in a way. You thought this would be the symbol of the death of Christianity, and now Christianity has put your symbol under its feet. Because we are stronger now than we were then. And while they were dying, they could not explain why they're dying this way. History bears out that people sometimes lost their mind and didn't even know how to react when this stuff was going on. But they kept the faith. I'm here to tell somebody, no matter what the doctor says, no matter what society says, no matter the thoughts that go through your head, you hold on to God. Because the last thing you want to let go of is Jesus. I don't know how I'm going to die, but you know what? We are fighting death left and right. We as Christians, we shouldn't fight it as much as we do. I'm serious. We got so many pills we're taking. We got so much prescription. I mean, doctors today, how can they see all these people and not get confused? I would. All right, Bill. Uh, I'm James. Okay, James. <laughs> How many times has McDonald's messed up your order? Huh? Every now and then I've had a doctor look at me and my wife and go, well, I made a mistake. What do you do? We're human. We can fight it, but it's coming. And when it comes, you better know Jesus. But not only that, here's something we got to remember because we love saying this. Your first name? Jeanette? How you doing? I'm Jason. What goes on in her head is her business. How many of you believe that what goes on in your head is your business? Therefore, it is none of your business what I think about you. It is none of your business what she thinks about you. And if you sit there and grumble and mumble and say, I'm going to quit church because Jeanette, because Jeanette up there looking at me funny, I know she's thinking bad thoughts about me. You're in the wrong. She's not. It is none of your business what Jeanette thinks about you. The only time it's your business is if she opens her mouth and lets her thoughts out. But as long as she keeps them to herself, I don't care what her eyeballs look like. And I don't care if she kind of looks at you funny. Jeanette may have a deal where she can't help the way she looks. Most of us can't help the way we look. It is none of your business. And that's what Jesus was telling Peter. It is none of your business what I think. 
And it's none of your business what the people you go to church with think. Here's your business that me and my house be saved. But we're going to come to church and we're going to get upset because, well, that church full of hypocrites and you don't even know all of them. Oh, you don't want to go to church with some hypocrites? but you'll sure burn in hell with them for eternity. It's time we realize there's just some things that's none of your business. And God may end up having you sit next to people that in your head you're like, they don't hate me. Look at them. They're judging me. They're looking down on me just because I, just because I got this on, got that on, do this and do that. they just thinking this. they thinking that. It's none of your business what they think. Here's what you need to do. You need to worship God anyhow. You need to praise God anyhow. And if you're right, God will take what you're doing and heap coals of vengeance upon their head. It is none of your business. I've had people come to me and say, oh, bro, of course, so and so this, so and so that, so and so this. How do you know? Oh, I just know. And usually when they say that, they don't know. Well, explain to me how you know. I know things. Well, how do you know? Well, you know, so-and-so on Facebook put this up. And I know when they put that up, they talk about me. I know they did, really. And we're going to go to God sometimes and say, God, if you love me, you do this. God, if you love me, you do that. I'm here to tell you, God loved you enough. You got up this morning, and you had another chance at life, and you had another chance to lift your hands and praise him. That is all that he needs to do. Because if you're not careful, you're going to wind up sitting at home saying it ain't worth it. It just ain't worth it. Nobody loves me. Nobody cares for me. Nobody this. It doesn't matter if anybody cares for you. They're not the ones that hung on Calvary and shed their blood. It is the one God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. I don't come here to make you happy. I come here to praise Him. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. Oh, but it gets on my nerves when people get caught up in this drama in their head. My mother, and if she's watching this, God bless you. But my mother's getting older. And it don't take much for me to get her going. All I got to do is say certain names. And before I know it, the word stupid comes out a hundred times. And I'm like, Mom, you're really good at calling people stupid. Well, it's because they are. How do you know? Well, I I know things. This up here is not working like it used to. But yet some of us do that even when this up here is working okay. We sit there and we analyze. Look at him up there shouting. Oh, I know him. He shouldn't be shouting. Look at her up there, singing and playing music like she's something. If they only knew what I knew. Shut your mouth and pray. That's what you need to do. Because it ain't none of their business what you know. And if you really got the love of God in you, you'll pray and say, God, get these feelings out. Help me to bury them so that we can go on and do the will of God. Boy, we think we know so much. Listen to what God told Job. Job chapter 40, verse 8. Job is looking for answers, and this is what he gets. Wilt thou also disannul my judgment? Wilt thou condemn me, that thou mayest be righteous? In other words, you want to make me look bad so that you look good. You ever seen them people? I know the Bible. I dare that preacher come talk to me because I know the Bible. I dare him come back here and lay hands and pray for me. I'll tell him a thing or two. I say this if you want to come to music. This sermon really changed, so God's talking to somebody. I started preaching when I was 16 and uh, held my first revival. And on the front row was a bunch of these young guys. I didn't know it, but about the same time I accepted my call, they accepted theirs. And, man, they were great to have at that revival. They amened everything. If I got upset peanut butter, they'd shoot through the ceiling. They were eager, happy. I seen them guys roll over each other on the floor. It was very eventful. If we had cell phones back then, it would have been a lot of fun. Little by little, them guys start backsliding. One of the guys, I didn't know him well, but he married a girl that I grew up with. And one day, I just really got a burden. You know, go see him. Well, these two younger guys, oh, bro, of course, we want to go with you. All right. 
So let's just be nice. We don't know what we're walking into. So I pull up. He's about to leave. So I pulled in behind him so he couldn't leave. And these guys jump out. You know, they're on fire for God. They're going to put a hell out with a squirt gun. And they run up there and start talking to him in his truck. And he, he punched the gas, almost drove through his garage, jumped out of the truck, ran the house. Well, I get out. They're already in the house. They're like bloodhounds, man. They're going to pray him through or kill him, one of the two. I walk in. His wife, she, when she saw me come in, she dropped her head. And she sat down. She said, they're in there. So I go in the living room. And I mean, them two guys, they're like, Jesus said this. We're going to pray. God's going to move. Blah, 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 blah. They had good intentions. I just, I just sat down on a chair. I didn't have to say nothing. All of a sudden, his name was Gene. He jumped up. He yelled, you want to know why I'm not coming to church anymore? One of them guys said, yeah, Gene, why ain't you coming? And no offense to the sound people. He said, because when I go to work, the sound man comes over here and flirts with my wife. Now, this was the funny part. Those two guys that act like they was going to put a hell out with a squirt gun, this is exactly what they did. I was sitting behind them. They both went. Like, it's your turn. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and in my head, I'm like, I ain't saying nothing until I feel me some holy go. <laughs> Gene stood up, and he took over the conversation. I'm going to tell you something. If you deal with people, and you let them take over that conversation and start really bleh on you, it'll defeat the purpose. So he starts just not only going after the sound man, he starts going after everybody in the church. Ain't nobody going to heaven. And suddenly the Holy Ghost hit me, and I just felt rebuking. I jumped up. Gene was a big boy. He pointed my finger at him. I said, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. His eyes bulged. I said it again. Gene, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And he hit the couch and covered his head with a pillow. I said, look. I get it. It's wrong. And I'd already looked back in the kitchen at his wife, and she nodded. It was true. I said, if you never go back to that church again, I don't blame you. But, Gene, that's not the only church. If I had to drive 20 miles, I'd drive 20 miles because God didn't do this. Man did. But this is where we're at. We don't like it that God doesn't kick all this out of our life, and sometimes bad times come. Well, folks, I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. I've had the bad. You've had the bad. And if we live another day, we may have some more bad. But know this. We serve a good God. And if he got us there, he'll get us out of it. we got to trust him. Because that's what, if you will, let's stand to our feet. That's what the Hebrew boys told the king. We don't know if he'll save us or not. But we won't worship an idol. We will only worship the living God. So I come to ask you, do you still believe God's good? Do you still live like you believe God's good? I get it. He's not safe. Sometimes he puts you right out there where you don't want to be. And sometimes he lets those punches from the enemy hit the soft spots. But you've got to believe he's good. I'm going to pray. This altar's open. Why don't we gather around? And let's remind the Lord we're in this for the long haul. I don't care how bad it gets. As for me and my house, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.